All right, it is two o'clock. I will broadcast now. Hello, everyone. My name is Nate Dalton, and I have uh, several BU connections I'm quite proud of. I'm a graduate of BU Law, class of 91, uh, as well as the parent of both a recent graduate from the College of Communication and a current student in the College of Arts and Sciences. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to today's discussion, Industry Trends in Sustainable Finance Investing. And this is featuring BU alumni Rob Fernandez and Carol Yepsen with moderator Susan Murphy, who's the executive director of BU's Impact Measurement and Allocation Program, or IMAP. It really is incredible that our alumni audience today is joining us from at least 28 states and 22 countries. And thank you very much for your interest in this topic, and thank you for participating. Now, many of you are donors to Boston University, and I'd like to spend a special thank you to you for making programming like this possible. Today's topic is near and dear to my heart, and the Impact Measurement and Allocation Program, where Susan's the executive director, is a program at BU that I support and one where I have the privilege of being on the advisory board. Now, before I introduce our featured speakers, I have a few housekeeping notes to address. Today's presentation is being recorded and will soon be available for on-demand viewing on the BU Alumni Association website, and you'll all be sent a link in follow-up correspondence. Also, our panelists are looking forward to answering your questions towards the end of the program. However, please feel free to submit your question at any time using the Q&A box that you'll find in the Zoom toolbar. Now it's time to introduce our featured guests. First, Rob Fernandez. Rob is Director of ESG Research at Breckenridge Capital Advisors. He received his MBA from BU's Questrom School of Business, a Bachelor of Science from Boston College, and is a Chartered Financial Analyst and an FSA credential holder. In addition to his director responsibilities, Rob is also a member of the firm's Sustainability Committee. In this role, Rob leads Breckenridge's ongoing ESG integration and engagement efforts, regularly contributes thought leadership, and performs corporate credit analysis. Rob has more than 20 years of research experience in the industry, including time at Opus Investment Management, State Street Bank and Trust Company, Cambridge Savings Bank, and Eastern Bank. In addition, Rob is a member of the advisory board for the Chief Executives for Corporate Purpose Strategic in Investor Initiative and is involved with a number of community organizations, including Big Brothers, Big Sisters of Massachusetts. Our next speaker is Carol Yepsen. Carol is head of the US for the UN supported Principles for Responsible Investment, or PRI. Carol earned both a BS and BA degrees, cum laude in finance and economics from Boston University, as well as an MBA in finance from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. Carol was an inaugural graduate of the Sustainability Leadership Forum at Yale University in 2016 and holds the Chartered Alternative Investment Analyst designation. In addition to her financial education, Carol completed musical training at the Juilliard School. Now, in her role at PRI, Carol is responsible for PRI's largest institutional investor market. PRI is recognized as the world's leading proponent of responsible investment, supporting a global network of more than 3,300 investor signatories and representing over 100 trillion in AUM, with the incorporation of ESG factors into investment decision-making and stewardship. Carol has been influential in the growth of RI and ESG integration practices in the US for over the past five years. And she joined PRI in 2015 to establish the organization's first US office. Since that time, PRI's US presence has more than tripled to over 750 institutional investor and service provider signatories. In addition, PRI has expanded its U.S. presence to include professionals in New York, Chicago, San Francisco, and Washington, D.C. Now, Carol has more than 20 years of experience across investment banking, private equity, and asset management. She's worked, she's worked closely with CIOs, ESG teams, investment boards, and trustees at many of the world's largest investors to guide them on their development of their ESG programs. And she's a frequent speaker at investment conferences globally and a guest lecturer on a number of university campuses. Finally, I'm now pleased to introduce our moderator, Susan Murphy. Susan is the Executive Director of Boston University's Impact Measurement and Allocation Program, or IMAP. Susan previously spent 12 years as an environmental sustainability consultant for ThinkStep, where she was the Director of Consulting and Innovation for the firm's North America division. Now acquired by Sphera, ThinkStep was the global leader in software and consulting for life cycle assessment and corporate ESG reporting tools. Susan holds a master's degree in technology and policy for MI, from MIT's engineering systems division and a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Olin College of Engineering. And she formerly served as a member of the board of trustees for Olin College of Engineering. 
Boston University's IMAP program is made possible by generous support from alumni donors. It's a socially responsible investing research initiative designed to operate at the nexus of leading academic research and the practical gaps in data needed to support real change in corporate behavior and asset management decision-making. IMAP is a joint initiative of two of the university's institutes, the Institute for Sustainable Energy and the Cicillo Institute for Ethics in the Global Economy. Boston University is honored to have Susan as the executive director of IMAP. And Susan, I now turn the floor over to you. Thank you very much for that introduction, Nate. I'd like to welcome to our virtual room here, Rob and Carol as well. And we're gonna overall treat this as a pretty informal discussion between the three of us about what we see as some of these trends within sustainable investing. First of all, I wanted to just start by talking about this term mm. ESG. These are three letters that I see popping up with increasing frequency lately. And I wanted to get the perspective from each of you on how you've seen this term um, evolving and proliferating and how it's changed um, in your observation over the, the recent years. Carol, I'll hand it over to you first. Sure, sure. And just um, thank you very much for the introduction uh, and for the bio, but um, again, to give some context for my role in this discussion, I head up U.S. Signatory Relations for the UN uh, Principles for Responsible Investment. So the term ESG investing was actually coined in conjunction with our founding back in April of 2006. Uh, so we've celebrated our 15 year anniversary uh, and our six PRI principles provide a framework for integrating ESG into investment decision making and active ownership. So I've uh, been with the PRI since uh, 2015, um, just over five and a half years. Um, you know, in that time frame, I would say responsible investing in ESG has, has changed considerably. Uh, it's, it's become much more mainstreamed uh, amongst investors. There's a much better understanding of the financial argument for ESG. I'd say fewer misconceptions around giving up returns. Uh, the idea that you have to somehow uh, give up uh, performance in order to do ESG integration, uh, moving to a much better understanding of the material significant significance of ESG factors uh, and how they factor into investment risk and return. Uh, we see that ESG is being applied across all asset classes now. Uh, so it's something where it, it gained uh, quite a bit of a momentum first around public equity, uh, but now we see, and certainly at the PRI, we provide guidance and support for our, our investor signatories in integrating ESG across all asset classes. Uh, so whether that's fixed income, uh, private equity, et cetera, uh, we have far more signatory interests coming on board from, from hedge funds and different types of investors, different types of strategies. Um, with the 3,300 signatories that we have right now, actually across more than 80 countries around the world, we really see every possible type of investment strategy and, and um, investment focus. And we really believe that there is uh, methodologies to incorporate ESG across, across all of them. Um, yeah, I'd also say just anecdotally, uh, when I started doing this with the PRI, you know, a, a very important part of our role is getting out and sp spreading the word on ESG. So speaking at a lot of conferences, um, oftentimes, uh, you know, five and a half years ago, uh, the ESG segment would tend to be in the context of um, another investment uh, conference. Oftentimes, the ESG panel would be the last panel of the afternoon right before uh, cocktails, so it wasn't, you know, the, the highest interest topic necessarily. Now we see, you know, full weeks devoted to sustainable investing on a regular basis, uh, and ESG has a, has a much more prominent place in the agenda um, for discussion. Uh, I would also say that there is much uh, greater focus on active ownership and engagement, um, so that comes in the form of voting proxies, engaging with companies um, that you're investing with uh, to understand their ESG strategy. And that really has been uh, critical uh, in our mind in, in making important progress uh, within the space as well. Rob? I'll hand it over to you. Great, thanks, Carol. Um, yeah, you made really great points. Uh, and I would just, maybe a couple things to add on um areas where where we've seen uh or where the ESG space has really 
changed and evolved tremendously over the last several years. Um, one is in just data availability. You know, the availability, and, and Carol, you just touched on it, but um, just to expand on, on it a little bit, um, the amount of ESG information and data that's available, you know, specifically to, to companies has grown just in, by an incredible amount uh, over the last several years. Just one s statistic that um, that we like to reference is that I think it was in 2011, and this comes comes from the Governance and Accountability Institute. Um, they track the number of companies that publish corporate sustainability reports. So a, a, a figure that they uh, have have reported is that in 2011, it's approximately 25% of the S&P 500 published a corporate sustainability report. And that just has grown over the last several years. To today, it's probably over 95%. Um, so there's just a lot more information out there that you can use, that we can use, you know, that uh, asset managers are using to evaluate a company's ESG profile and performance. That creates other challenges for sure, um, because the quality of, of what's being reported, you know, it can, can be questionable at times. Um, but that brings me to another topic area that's really evolved tremendously is just the, around the definition and the use of the word materiality. Um, meaning, um, and Carol, you mentioned this as well, um, you know, basically um, the, the term materiality, which my, you know, we feel at Breckenridge and I know others do as well, that SASB has, you know, the, the organization SASB, and I can expand on that, has done a lot to influence that definition, but it basically means when you're doing ESG analysis, you want to focus in on what's really material, what's a key driver to the company's, company's finances or, or credit profile. Um, and when we, when we at Breckenridge were first thinking about ESG analysis 10 years ago, um, our understanding of what it meant to consider these factors and evaluate them was really, um, you know, early in early days. It's, it was really nascent, uh, and it's evolved a lot. And I think the whole industry it has evolved as well. Where now it's really focusing in on what's really material to the company, um, and uh, so getting an understanding there. And then finally, a, a final area that where ESG and sustainable investing has really changed. Uh, is just the amount of attention that's being paid to the space by regulators and legislature, legislators, and um, especially uh, most recently um, by the U.S. federal government. And I was thinking I could turn this over to Susan to kind of expand on this. We were uh, speaking with each other just in preparation for the call and all noting that we had some of the same homework we were working on this this week, where there is the currently the SEC has a call out for public comment on uh, to what degree you know, climate issues and data is material to financial investment and uh, each of us with our respective organizations is working on answering some subset of the 15 points of questions put out there um, to, to help figure out which aspects of this should be regulated, where are the gaps, um, et cetera, in order to make the necessary data available to everyone. Um, so that's a, even though we sit in three different types of organizations, we are all seeing some of the, the same uh, challenges and opportunities that we're each working on. Uh, I want to come back to that question around materiality and how that's that's changed over time. So Rob, could you give an example of what, you know, when we're thinking about what was material to your investment decisions back 10 years ago, you know, how, what did ESG mean, or did you even call it ESG then, or were you calling it SRI, or what were you calling it um, previously? And could you give me some specific examples of kind of what you used to look at versus what you're looking at now with the, the today's data that's available? Yeah, that's a great question, Susan. Um, so when we, maybe just for a little bit of background, um, Breckenridge, we first, um, thought about the idea of integrating ESG considerations into our credit research process. Um, it, it was in, in 2010, late 2010, and we did it for a couple different reasons, but one of them um, is that we felt that by considering 
these factors, it would enhance our fundamental credit research, our investment research. And it certainly has done so over time. You know, we, we get a better understanding about the company we're investing in, about the quality of management, you know, factors like that. Um, so, uh, so we decided, okay, we'd like to do this. And uh, it was in part because of the efforts of the PRI. And it was only a few years after the term had been coined. And um, so when we first were thinking about it, we, w there was a lot of discussion internally about, okay, what does this even mean? You know, what is an environmental issue that we should be thinking about? And how best to, should we systematically incorporate it into our research process? There was a, there was a lot of discussion about that because the analysts are already very, very busy considering fundamental factors, um, you know, credit, credit factors such as leverage or cash flows and margins. How do you weave in additional um, indicators, inputs into that process? So we wanted to make sure that it was uh, that it, we could do it in a, in a way that was efficient for the analysts and you know didn't bog them down. So so initially it was there was some really there was like internal education, a lot of reading, a lot of discussions, reaching out to the PRI at that time. Um, another organization in Boston that was really helpful to us as we learned about this was is Series, a nonprofit based in Boston. So definitely a lot of reading and edu education. And as we were as we got started, so to your question, Susan. Um, you know, you would go into a company's corporate sustainability report at that time, and you still see it to some degree now, and you would see, you, you see um, some nice narratives and descriptions about um, what they're doing to address, you know, issues that are affecting their company, whether it has, has to do with, with a social issue like talent management and, and recruitment, you know, for their workforce, or if it's a resource intensive company, maybe it has to do with greenhouse gas emissions or waste and water use. Um, but, you know, maybe the disclosure uh, wasn't the best. And, um, and then also, you know, and this, this speaks to um, the fact that it was early days from an ESG analysis perspective for us. Um, you, you look back at maybe some of the, the ESG uh, write-ups that we did at that time, we talked about a company's corporate philanthropy efforts. And um, corporate philanthropy is really an important topic. And it's, and you, you know, it's nice to see that a company is supporting the communities where they operate and providing, you know, support to schools and, and other things. But, um, and we would talk about that maybe 10 years ago, um, but we learned over time that although it is really important, it's nice that maybe a company is, is donating 5% of profits to charitable organizations, you know, is that really a key credit driver? Is that really a material issue that a company needs to manage so that they can, uh, you know, improve profitability or, or protect, you know, protect their risk, you know, or manage a particular risk um, so that, um, you know, it, it it, it, it supports their company over the long term. Um, so that, that is, is, is an example of how our thinking about a particular issue or area shifted over time. And, that, and I mentioned this organization before, the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, SASB. Um, they, have, they have really focused a lot on this materiality issue and they came out with standards for 77 companies on what's best to disclose uh, by sector and you know, and so, and, and and it's very so it's very sector relevant. And our analysts and myself, uh, we've we've been supporters of SASB for a long time, and we've been informed by their great work um, over time. So, so you can look at what SASB has uh, states about a key topic or a key sector, and you can kind of look at that, and analysts can look at that, and then compare it to what the company's disclosing in their corporate sustainability report. So maybe it's um, a, a construction uh, machinery company like Deere or Caterpillar, and and um, there's a, a SASB sustainability topic related to I think um, hazardous waste, and SASB SASB would say that that company should disclose metrics around that topic. So then you go to the company's CSR and say, are they disclosing that? And at times they're not, and so that says something about the quality of disclosure and the quality of the risk management. 
Um, so hopefully that's helpful, but that's a little bit to little indication, a little um, demonstration to show how, how our thinking has changed over time. Sure. And to follow up on that before I switch back over to, to Carol. So you said the philanthropy is nice, but not necessarily as financially material as some other things. What has emerged? Can you give an example or two of something that has emerged as having a strong uh, financial materiality in your incorporation of ESG that, you know, absolutely, this is something you look at all the time now that maybe was, you know, less prominent 10 years ago? That's a great question. Um, I think number one has to be climate risks. Uh, we, we, we've been spending and thinking a lot internally about, and it's especially for certain sectors that are, um, you know, maybe the energy sector, um, metals and mining, you know, carbon intensive sectors like that. Uh, you know, 10 years ago, we were thinking about climate risks to some degree, but not like we are today. It's, it's, there's, it's, a, it's a very, um, you know, we, we're talking about it a lot and thinking a lot about how best to consider these factors in our research. And we have been, like the, our energy analyst thinks a lot about the so-called carbon transition risk, the risk that the global economy is gonna shift to a low or no, no carbon based, um, based economy and what does that do to the energy sector? You know, maybe it's maybe that sector is okay for the next few years, but, but as a fixed income investor, we're buying bonds that are with 10 or 30 year maturities. And maybe this transition risk will surface much sooner than, um, than maybe we thought a few years ago. And, and you can see how climate risks, you know, can impact really just about any sector that we're investing in to varying degrees. So that would probably be the key one that we're focused on today versus 10 years ago. Thank you. And Carol, I know PRI runs an annual survey and we spoke briefly before a little bit about how that's been evolving and changing over time in terms of the types of questions and the level of detail that you're looking for today versus you used to. Could you tell us a bit about what that survey is for those people who are not familiar with it and then explain how it's been maturing? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, uh, PRI just this year introduced uh, a new uh, reporting framework, new version of the reporting framework, which really uh, ups the game on responsible investing in ESG, um, if you will. Um, so taking a step back in terms of what it is, um, all of our uh, global signatories around the world, one of the requirements when they sign up uh, to the PRI is that they will report to us on an annual basis. Um, with quite a bit of uh, level of detail, as I'm sure Rob can attest to, um, in terms of what their actual ESG integration uh, activities look like, uh, both uh, from the standpoint of each of their individual portfolios, what are they doing um, on ESG and credit and fixed income, what are they doing public equity, et cetera, et cetera, but also what is their active ownership and engagement um, activities look like, um, and also what is their policy engagement uh, activities look like. Um, so it's, it's a pretty in-depth survey. Um, it's something not only that gives our signatories a mechanism to kind of understand how they're doing on ESG and how they're progressing in their ESG integration activity over time, you know, giving them a benchmark from year to year on how they're progressing and also helping them understand how they're doing vis-a-vis -vis other peer investors. Um, but it's really also something that um, investors, so asset owners, public pension funds, endowments, foundations, uh, the clients of investment managers can utilize in their due diligence as they're selecting managers. Um, there's a public component and a private component to the report. Uh, and um, what we're seeing is an increasing usage of the, the public um, as well as the, the private component because um, an asset owner can go in and make a request uh, to an investment manager to see their full public and private uh, PRI reporting. And then we're seeing them utilizing that to really see the difference maybe between an investment manager that has uh, nice marketing materials and, and a good story um, versus you know, a, a greater lev level of depth uh, on what they're actually doing and how they're really living up to the commitment uh, that they sign on to as a PRI signatory. So it's exciting to see it uh, being used in that way increasingly. Um, and it's something over time, uh, the questions you know, have become more challenging. We've incorporated minimum requirements 
Uh, so for example, one of the minimum requirements right now is that all PRI signatories have to have an ESG policy uh, that applies to 50% or more of their assets under management. Um, that percentage uh, over time um, could, could change, could become higher. Uh, and we have other minimum requirements. So for example, there has to be a designated person within the investment manager um, that's responsible for the overall ESG integration efforts. Uh, there has to be senior management support. So typically we have the, the chief investment officers signing off on the PRI submissions uh, to make sure that there is that, that C-level uh, support for what, what's being implemented within the organizations. Um, so we've really seen that uh, push the industry forward um, and, and you know, really rise the tide on, on what constitutes best practice in ESG. You know, I can just add briefly um, that we find the PRI survey to be really helpful, just as you mentioned, Carol, as a, it's a really useful self-assessment tool. Um, you can look to the questions and they can be, they can offer kind of, you know, guidance and instruction on, on how to enhance your own ESG integration capabilities. And because this is such an evolving space, sometimes you may think that you're doing a good job integrating these these factors, and then you look to the survey and, and think, "Oh, wow, that's that's a really good, you know, useful global perspective that can it, that we, that we've used to challenge ourselves." And especially the um, this year's survey, as you mentioned, is, has a lot of new new and tougher questions, and it gets you thinking internally about, you know, best practices. So it's it's a, it's a really useful tool. Yeah, and this year's thanks, Robin, and this year's survey in particular. Um, we've, we've included a greater focus on what we would like to call a real world impact. So what we're seeing around the world is, is a greater focus by investors in wanting to understand not only uh, the material significance of, of ESG factors to the individual as well as to the systematic uh, you know, risk level within their investments, but also really understanding what the, what the real world impact um, of their investment portfolio is. Uh, so a lot of our signatories are using uh, the UN Sustainable Development Goals as a framework to do that. Um, so we're seeing um, a lot of investors, particularly leading the way, I would say, in some of the larger European investors are mapping their portfolio to the Sustainable Development Goals um, and then you know, utilizing that information to a better plan going forward, you know, how their investments actually um, impact those those um, those goals. But I also add actually to what Rob said, you know, with respect to the, the materiality and, and certainly the, the increased focus right now on, on climate over the years, um, it, it's certainly something where in, investors have moved um, from maybe a misperception, I'll say, um, where ESG or, you know, responsible investing was something that they might have mistakenly associated with, with being uh, equivalent to philanthropy, um, whereas, you know, it very much was not, um, not philanthropy. It's something, you know, at the PRI, we, we view it as uh, a more compre comprehensive approach to risk management and opportunity identification. So it's really something that you can you can add to your existing investment process that will help you with your um, help improve your risk adjusted returns, um, as opposed to, you know, Rob mentioned, you know, oftentimes a company will have a very nice uh, CSR report uh, with a lot of information on, on topics that aren't actually very impactful to the bottom line, the corporate financial performance of the company. Uh, or the associated investment performance. And you know, all of that information is, is good. Uh, certainly a company that is contributing to the community, uh, doing well by the community in which it operates, uh, provides them a certain social license to operate that can have the effect of, of increasing demand for their products and services, making them more well-regarded you know, in investment terms. Maybe that means that they have their trade, their stock is trading at a higher multiple. So it can make its way into the, into the valuation. Um, but it is very important when we talk about ESG integration, really to make that distinction uh, away from be being philanthropy as it being something that's really a core part of the investment process for, for most investors now. Thank you. And follow on on that we have from the, the chat window here is someone's asking, is there an accessible list of the PRI signatories? Yeah, it's actually available on our website. You can go on our website and, uh, and see the list of signatories globally. Perfect. 
And then just another more generic question. So one of the things I've been observing in my role with the IMAP program now at Boston Unity is as we're talking to different people in the investment community, they're describing that while ESG is becoming more popular and more data is becoming available, they're still seeing a lot of data gaps. Um, and there's still a lot that they want to know that they don't know or is hard to get on a consistent basis. Uh, could either of you comment a bit on on that in terms of where do you you know we've come a long way but we have a long way to go what are some of the major gaps that need to get filled in order to make this a little more seamless than it is today yeah i mean i'll start with that you know touching again on the climate topic um i think a big topic is is uh what a company's climate transition strategy is, what their approach is going to be to adjust their business model over time uh, to the climate transition. So, you know, we're seeing major impacts to that. You know, only only last week um, we saw at ExxonMobil, for example, there was a proxy fight um, in which um, two new board members were elected uh, specifically on the basis of a desire of investors, and, and this is you know, including some of the world's largest investors like, like Vanguard, some of the world's largest public pension funds like CalSTRS, um, getting behind the idea that a company needs to have an effective climate transition strategy. And if they don't have that, um, you know, they'll, they'll make moves to adjust the company until they do. So you know, we're seeing a lot of movement on this. You know, another area where there hasn't been historically um, maybe good or comparable data, because it's not only the issue of, of not having enough data, but having it in, in a comparable apples to apples format so that investors can utilize it in, in easily comparing companies within the same sector. So particularly in light of the pandemic um, and everything that you know, the world, frankly, has been going through, that's highlighted a lot of social issues where investors might not have uh, pre previously thought about those uh, so clearly as uh, materially significant issues. But now you're, they're better understanding it. But yes, you know, when you have a global health pandemic, that's going to impact uh, your, your corporate financial performance and your business models in a very big way. Uh, oftentimes, and therefore they need data from the companies uh, on those factors as well. Yeah, and I, I can add, um, I definitely agree, Carol, with this, with what you said about, um, well, your second point about um, standardization of disclosure. I th think that's such a, such a big issue. Um, so, you know, we're able to look at, at, at ESG data from a different, a couple different sources. We subscribe to MSCI, and they have a a, a module um, that where we were able to access uh, carbon and climate related information about companies. And then uh, the Bloomberg terminal, um, they have an ESG function um, page or a whole section within the within the within their system that um, where Bloomberg is scraping the web for uh, publicly related or publicly disclosed ESG information, gathering it, categorizing it across, I think it's, I think it's something like 600 different ESG indicators. And so we can go in there and put in a ticker for a company and look at the, and look at the ESG information by ESG topic. And they, they do a nice job putting it there by year. So you can like kind of look at trends. And you can and there's a little graphic function as well, um, where you can kind of you know see that trend. Um, but the big you know so so you know so that's that has certainly that's very helpful when it comes to ESG analysis. But the gaps really have to do with standardization. Um, there was a interesting paper that came out a couple of years ago that looked at, if I remember right, um, the the researchers looked at the Fortune uh, 50. So the top 50 largest companies, and then looked at their health and safety metrics that were disclosed. And they counted up that something like 30 to 34, there were th the company used 30 to 34 different ways to measure health and safety performance. Um, so how do you how do you compare one company to another when when how the information is disclosed can be you know very different? And that so that's such a big that's such a big challenge. And and so that's where, you know, like I mentioned, we've been supporters of SASB and their standardization effort. But the, the challenge with that is that the disclosure is voluntary. 
and the number of companies that, that disclose SASB related uh, recommended uh, metrics has increased tremendously over the last three or four years. And so that's great. And so Bloomberg and others can, and we, you know, we can go into a corporate sustainability report, look at the SASB information. That's, you know, when I, the reason why I like it, as I mentioned before, it's financially material, uh, along with other good information that, that's in the report. So you can grab it, um, but still there's lots of companies that are not disclosing that information. Um, so there's there's a lot of um, movement going on in the ESG disclosure space um, to try to drive the standardization. Like the World Economic Forum a year or two ago came out with their own set of metrics that were based on SASB and the GRI, the Global Reporting Initiative, and the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosure. There's all so that, you know all these acronyms speaks to the challenge, and I think. I think with the SEC getting involved um, on climate, but not just climate, they've mentioned SEC officials have talked about creating a, an ESG, a broadly ESG uh, framework that would be you know, mandated for companies to disclose. That would be huge. And then you, you're seeing this in the EU as well with the taxonomy. Um, so, so there's a lot of efforts and you can see maybe in the next couple of years that there will be some, some coalescing around a, a list of, of particular metrics that companies need to disclose, but until that happens, there are certainly gaps and then they remain a challenge. Absolutely. And that's part of what IMAP is trying to fill in as well as some of those gaps, because we know, and we've um, been you know, fortunate to have some great conversations with the people over at Bloomberg and in some of these other organizations about, you know, where's that data coming from? And sometimes, like you said, the companies are following an established standard and they put out a nice annual report that makes it clear and obvious. And other times they don't, other times they skip years. And so, um, or they change the format or they change the methodology that they're using from year to year. And so it gets very messy very quickly. And so there's a lot of different people trying to find the best way to fill those gaps accurately and in a way that will kind of properly inform your investment decisions moving forward so you can really understand you know, where they've been and where they're trying to go. With that, I think I might start to turn it over to some of the questions. We've got questions starting to populate in the window here. Um, and everyone watching, feel free to, to add yours. So one is, I'm gonna kind of combine these, these two from the same person. So. I think this is more for you, Rob. Um, kind of how does CSR work factor into ESG investment? And is there a way for corporate ESG assessments to be factored into bond ratings and credit risk? Oh yeah, great questions. Um, yeah, I can start with those. And um, so how, how we think about, let me see the, for the first question. So looking at corporate sustainability reporting. Um, so the way we think about or the way we approach ESG analysis for, for companies, um, we have a, an ESG model uh, where, where, where we're uh, bringing in company reported information like from the Bloomberg terminal. Um, but we also subscribe to MSCI and Sustainalytics because it does help with the comparability piece. Um, we may not always agree, we don't always agree with their methodologies, um, but we think they do provide a really important service because of because they are scoring companies for their ESG performance, um, so that so you, we have these factors in a model, um, but then we also like to do qualitative ESG research. We want to we we look at what's disclosed by the company, what they're writing about. So that's where the CSR, the corporate sustainability report, comes in. Um, the analysts um, are looking, and th th this is our fundamental analysts. They do the fundamental research as well as the ESG research, um, but they're looking at corporate sustainability reports, um, reading through, looking for disclosure around, you know, those material ESG topics that, we, that we've discussed. Um, you know, has a company set a target to reduce, you know, water use or waste or emissions, you know, for these, you know, depending on what's most material for that sector and company, have they set a target, you know, specific to greenhouse gas emissions. There's been a, this initiative that's really grown a lot called the Science-Based Targets Initiative. And we, so we'd like to see if a company has set a target like that and are they making progress on it, you know, good progress. And Science-Based Target Initiative is basically, it's basically saying, you know, a company can, can commit to cutting 
their emissions in align to, with what science says should happen to, to be uh, net zero by 2050, you know, as, a, as per the, the Paris Agreement. Um, so that's where the CSR comes into play is that you, we can really look at the disclosure and based on that, we can see, okay, how committed is the company to improving their environmental footprint or managing social risks or governance, governance risks? And then the third piece that kind of we, we weave in has to do with engagement. So we, we talk on an ongoing basis with companies about their ESG practices and priorities and, you know, findings from these direct conversations kind of help, helps to maybe cut through the greenwashing a little bit, the so-called greenwashing, and, and we can kind of bring the takeaways and kind of combine it with the qualitative and, and the, the quantitative piece of our research. So that, hopefully that, that, that's helpful and sheds light on our approach. And then just the second question has to do with credit ratings and ESG. Um, there's been a lot of um, progress made by the credit rating agencies to factor ESG analysis in, into, their, into their ratings. Moody's, S&P, and Fitch have all have all made a lot of progress on this. And the PRI, there was an initiative there a few years ago that I think has really pushed them to, to do so. And you may, the rating agencies may have said, and they have said that they, they have been looking at these factors, um, but it was hard to determine if that was the case. So they're being much more transparent about how ESG issues are, are being incorporated into their ratings. And so you're now you're seeing a lot more being written by the rating agencies about ESG risks. For, for example, Moody's um, talked about the energy sector and about climate risks and put a few companies on credit watch negative, noting th the challenges that these companies face uh, as people move away, uh, as global economy moves, moves away from oil and gas. Um, so hopefully that answers the questions, you know, the questions that were posed. Yeah, and I'd like to add to that on the on the credit ratings question. Um, yeah, PRI has done a lot of work over the past um, four to five years on ESG and credit risk. Uh, and as Rob mentioned, you know, most of the major uh, credit ratings agencies have now come on board as PRI signatories, um, you know, committing to upholding uh, ESG standards. And, and they have made a lot of progress, uh, not only in including ESG factors uh, in an appropriate way into their into their credit ratings, but also I would say in terms of um, creating more transparency uh, to help investors understand what ESG factors might already be incorporated into a credit rating and you know, what other ESG risks might they have to take into account separately uh, when they're evaluating an investment in a company. You know, one challenge, for example, is the fact that a credit rating uh, might reflect information over the course of, of five years um, or, or so, whereas many ESG factors um, can play out over a longer time period. And so uh, there, is, there is necessity for an investment analyst to, to take a, a longer term approach uh, to how they incorporate those ESG factors into their analysis because of that kind of timing mismatch. Um, but the credit ratings agencies, you know, they've all come a tremendous way um, in improving uh, their guidance for investors as to how they should be thinking about these things. And, and PRI has really worked uh, together with the, the agencies to, to push them forward. Next question is, how do you assess the reliability of company reported information when it's not audited? I mean, I'm happy to take that question. I mean, here lies the challenge. I, that, good question. Um, well, I'll, I'll say that there now nowadays there are a lot of different mechanisms that companies can utilize to to audit the information that they report, and you're seeing increasingly companies that are choosing choosing to do that. Um, but you know, one mechanism, of course, that investors can utilize to assess the credibility of the information, really to make sure that a company is not greenwashing, essentially, is by incorporating ESG into their due diligence. Um, when they're investing in the company. So that can, that, can, that can be when they're having a conversation with the management team, with the CEO, with the CFO, they incorporate ESG questions into their line of questioning, you know, adding that maybe to their normal uh, line of questioning that they would have in a management meeting. Um, there's a lot more collaborative engagement happening now. So asking those questions of the companies in coalition with other investors 
Um, you know, that there are a lot of tremendous benefits to doing that aside from you know, the, the, the power of many voices, um, collectively working on issues um, can be in many cases much more effective than, than individually engaging with companies in some cases. Um, but you know, all, all of that being said, you know, it, it's, it's still a challenge you know, the, because of the, the things that Rob mentioned in terms of the sustainability and ESG reporting and, and not having that um, standardized data being disclosed and mandated, um, that that's going to be a challenge until that problem essentially gets solved. It was a great point, Carol. Really great points. Um, I don't. I don't have a lot to add except to say that um, we have seen uh, the number of companies ha have their uh, corporate sustainability reports audited or attested um, start to rise, but it's still a pretty small percentage. So I think overall, you, you kind of have to take the company's word for it. You know, you have to. You hope that these companies. Um, are disclosing information that's 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 accurate. Now, it, it, that, that's not always the case, and and how they're collecting the information internally within these organizations um, is is changing, and I think improving. And um, the other point to mention is that these companies, you know, when we when we first started engaging with them uh, in 2013. Uh, you know, talking with them directly about their ESG practices today to today, the level of sophistication in how they articulate their sustainability strategy has improved tremendously. That's another big change in the space. And, you know, companies now have corporate sustainability officers, in some cases that report directly to the CEO, they have sustainability departments, climate experts internally. So, I mean, so the, I guess the idea, you know, hopefully, hopefully when you have this kind of expertise internally, um, there's, a, there's a level of oversight and quality control to the to the ESG data that they're publishing. But it's still a challenge, like Carol said, and we certainly would like to see, you know, this corporate sustainability reporting and metrics uh, audited. And I do think like the big four accounting firms are, are all over this <laughs> and see this as um, as an opportunity for them. Yeah, I'll add to that as well. Interestingly, we're seeing a lot of, you know, very technologically sophisticated mechanisms for um, investors doing audits on information reported by companies, you know, with the proliferation of big data, artificial intelligence, um, you know, there are very sophisticated ways that investors are using to, to not take a company at its word necessarily and really check, check on their, their statements around ESG issues. So that's a, a really interesting space to follow as well. All the, the technology that's going into to verification uh, within supply chains and, and all of that is evolving at a very rapid pace. That's yeah. it. I, maybe I can just add, oh, sorry, go ahead, Susan. Go, you can finish up first, Rob. I was just gonna say, that's a, yeah, that's a really great point too. We've been thinking a lot about natural language processing satellite imagery, how you can use that to, to essentially verify and confirm when a company is disclosing. We're still, still in early days for that, but I feel like I've, you know, we, I'm getting an email every other week from a new artificial intelligence company that's saying that they can help evaluate ESG information. So it's, it's, it, it, it seems like it's early days, but it's evolving quickly. Absolutely. And in a, a plug for another upcoming event, I was going to mention the IMAP is hosting a webinar in I think it's two weeks on June 17th, where we're going to have three different professors speaking to some of the research they're doing really related to this type of question, where we have people who are looking at um, GIS mapping, as well as looking at employees' reports on their employers on websites like Glassdoor and others where you, know, you there's, there's the one story that the company tells about how they treat their employees. And then there's another story sometimes on social media um, or these other platforms where maybe you get a different insight into what's happening within the employee and what policies are truly in place or utilized um, versus on paper. So there, there is a lot of research going into these sorts of into this question of trying to figure out, well, how do we know what's the real story? Um, is this just marketing where it's not regulated yet? Or is this, you know, reliable data? So it's, it's in progress and um, we'll have a little bit more to cover on that topic and that next webinar in a couple of weeks. You can find it on the, the IMAP website, bu.edu slash IMAP. Uh, <laughs>
Okay. Uh, this is Marianne from the Alumni Association. We will also send out a link to that particular event so people have it handy in the follow-up correspondence. Thank you, Marianne. All right, moving along to some of the other questions we have here. Um, what about privately held companies is one of the questions. You know, is there a way to determine ESG among privately held? Yeah, I mean, I can take that question. And, and, and certainly, uh, you know, we have a, a growing uh, signatory base of the PRI amongst uh, private equity investors. And, you know, certainly in the time that I've been doing this, you know, five and a half years, I've really seen uh, an emergence within the context of private equity, where it started as something that was mainly focused on by the investor relations folk, folks. And now it's really in, deeply embedded in, into the deal making process for a lot of private equity investors. And arguably, uh, you know, you can say that private equity investors in many cases have the ability to impact change within companies um, more effectively than an investor that might own a you know, very small slice through a pub public equity allocation uh, within a firm. So, so definitely we're seeing um, a, lot of, a lot of progress within private equity. Um, you know, the format that it takes can be somewhat different. You know, you see a lot of uh, due diligence questionnaires, uh, PRI developed in conjunction with um, various industry groups, uh, an ESG due diligence questionnaire for limited partners that they use uh, with, with the GPs, um, a series of questions that they can incorporate as they're looking at making an investment in a company. Um, and that certainly has pushed, uh, pushed the industry forward. And we're seeing more and more of that, more specialization, not only just private equity broadly, you're seeing the similar things happening. And PRI has published similar um, DDQs within infrastructure, within other areas uh, for hedge funds as well. Um, but yeah, there's a, there's a, a big opportunity. And, and frankly, it's very important because you are actually seeing um, a shift uh, to where more and more of the world's outstanding equity is being held privately. So it's, it's a really important um, that that make progress. And then what about for individual investors? We have a question here from someone saying, you know, they're, they're not using an investment advisor um, and not asking for specific advice, but in their own personal investing, how can they do some research and know whether what they're doing is actually meeting ESG goals or is it just greenwashing? Where should they look? Yeah, I mean, I'd say it, it's the same place that the, the investors are, are looking, you know, of course, an, an individual um, might not have access to all of the same information, but there is a lot that you do have access to, you know, keep up reading the news stories, uh, watch the interviews with the, with the company CEOs and, and uh, people from the companies, listen carefully to what they say, listen to their story. Um, you know, those are some of the same things that investment analysts would do, and I would encourage the individual investors do the same. And I, and I would I would add briefly too that I think you're starting to see how um, sustainability ratings are becoming available in in public ways like uh, Yahoo Finance for example I think if you I've noted that I've seen that if you put in a ticker and you bring up a company it'll also show the sustainalytics ESG for score for that company so you can you can at least see what that ESG research provider how they're scoring that company for their ESG performance and I I think you're seeing that with with uh, brokerage firms as well, like TD Ameritrade is making some ESG scoring available. And then another piece too is that Morningstar, um, they actually acquired Sustainalytics in the last year, but even before that they had, a, I think a 50% ownership of Sustainalytics and they started incorporating their ESG methodology into, into how they rate mutual funds. So they have, I think it's a five globe scale and it, so you, you, you know, as an individual investor, if you're interested in investing in a mutual fund, you can look to Morningstar's ESG rating on that fund. Yeah, I'll note, it, it's funny. I, I noticed the ESG rating on Yahoo Finance uh, recently that it, that it was just above the quarterly earnings um, information, which I thought was-, was Oh, bad. is that right? Yeah. Wow. yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it kind of shows you the kind of elevated elevated prominence, and and certainly I would agree with that. You know, look at look at those ratings. I'd say that they can be you know most effectively utilized as probably a flag for something to investigate further, and you'll see that that's really the way investors are utilizing it as well. You know, don't necessarily make buy sell decisions explicitly on the basis of a rating unless you really understand what what the rating is. Um, but it's a great mechanism to use as a flag for things that you should be looking further at. All right. Another question is, is the U.S. Social Investors Forum still a good resource? 
I, I would say so, definitely. Yeah, they have a helpful website with information about sustainable investing, and they have an there's an annual conference um, that always has really great speakers, um, and um, and then they have other other ongoing kind of webinars and um, education kind of forums as well. So yes, I, I would say it is a great resource. Yeah. And I'll say that, yeah, I would, I would agree with that. I'd say that there are a lot of, you know, fantastic organizations working in the space. I think there's been a lot of progress in those organizations working collaboratively um, on ESG issues in a, in a more effective way. Um, making a plug for the PRI website, I'll say that a lot of our resources um, are available freely on the website. So I'd encourage uh, anyone that's interested to go to our website at www.unpri.org. And there's so much information that you can just download um, available freely to educate yourself on these issues. I think we have time for maybe one last question here, which is a big one. Uh, but the question is, what are some of the challenges posed by the complex and global supply chains when trying to determine ESG metrics? That is a good question. Yeah, Carol, you feel free to go first. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the question, um, uh, you know, highlights the answer to a certain extent, complex and global supply chains. Um, you know, so some of the things we were talking about, uh, you know, technological de developments, um, you know, blockchain technology, for example, uh, being utilized to more effectively monitor supply chains. Um, those are some of the answers to these, to, to these challenges. Um, but they are tremendous challenges, um, you know, understanding if, you, if you're a company with operations across multiple companies, um, you know, operating with multiple products, you know, multiple business lines, it becomes very, very complex and challenging. Um, so I think, I think technological solutions are going to be really the best, uh, the best answer to this. Um, and, and we're seeing a lot, a lot happening. Yeah, and, and my answer to that, just from my you know twelve years in consulting previously, is that it's data collection is you know the biggest challenge here. That it's much easier for a company to report on what they are directly purchasing, the emissions coming out of their facility, the policies with which they treat their own employees. But then when you look at their suppliers, well, suppliers of a certain size maybe have that corporate sustainability officer who can fill out your specific questionnaire to answer the questions you're looking for. Um, um, and have the resources to do those calculations on their own carbon emissions and other policies. Um, but as you get to smaller and smaller suppliers in different geographies around the world, they might not have the, the resources available to answer all the questions that you have, or they might not you know, they may not know the answers to all the questions that the local investors want to know. So it's just really hard to find the right people who can answer the questions, who have access to the real answers of all the data that you're looking for the further you go out into a supply chain. Well, it has come that time where we're going to need to close things out. What an incredible discussion. Thank you, Rob, Carol, and Susan for joining us today. It was a fantastic opportunity for our alumni audience to learn about the complex nuances of ESG factors from your insights. I certainly learned a lot, but can't even begin to summarize what, uh, what that really all is uh, since this isn't my space, but boy, it was informative. I thank to our audience uh, for taking time to log on, listen and ask really great questions. We hope you learned a lot from today's discussion. I also want to take this time to thank the many donors out there who support the good work and valuable programs of the university. You help make this institution a rich environment for our students, faculty, alumni, and friends. And for that, we are truly grateful. We look forward to having all of you join us again in the future. Keep an eye on the BU alumni calendar for upcoming events and check back often as programs are added on a regular basis. I will be sure to send everyone a link to the program recording in follow-up correspondence. And I'll include that event uh, that is taking place next week that Susan had mentioned, the PRI website, where you can see a list of the signatories and other resources, and a, any other information that our uh, illustrious panel has shared with you today. And uh, I just wanna say thank you again, take care and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.